Hi, everybody. Good morning. Nice to see everyone. Friends, I'm John Cavadini. I'm the director of the Institute for Church Life. And the Institute for Church Life is hosting this series of football Saturday lectures called Saturdays with the Saints. Friends, while I'm welcoming everyone, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of Mike Geddes, whose this building bears his name, Mike Geddes. Wow. He's a trustee of the university, and so he's here for the trustee. Friends, what better way is there to spend Saturday than with the Saints? And if you think about it, Saturday, Saturday is the ancient Sabbath, and the Sabbath was always taken as a prefiguration of eternity. And so that eternal life was thought of as the eternal Sabbath and the eternal Sabbath rest. And so in a very real way, friends, we hope anyway, that our destiny will be to spend Saturday with the saints in eternity. So here we are, this is a little bit of a foretaste of eternal life. So, wow. Thank you. <laughs> it's true though. In what better way than to spend Saturday with the Saints than to listen to a lecture today by Larry Cunningham, who is the John A. O'Brien Chair of Theology Emeritus right here on the, on the campus of the University of Notre Dame. Although it is said of many, many people of whom it really isn't true, that this person needs no introduction. I think it really is true that Larry really does need no introduction, especially for an audience who's come to listen to a lecture on the saints. <clears throat> Larry's work in spirituality, in theology, in mysticism, has had a major focus on the saints, on the lives of the saints, and on their place in Catholicism. <clears throat> We can think especially of his work on St. Francis, for example, or on Thomas Merton, or his recent handbook on the saints. But what is the inner history of these many public accomplishments? <clears throat> to, an heir, to, to an age whose ear for mystery has gone cold, Larry has been able to offer a pedagogy in mystery that has persuaded people to look again, to rethink not to give up on the ancient insights, but to see in them the possibility of the renewal of our own age, prone perhaps to rationalism, and to the reduction of all mystery to mere puzzles, which eventually will be solved. How boring. Larry's work has reminded us all of the mystery with which life is inevitably and beautifully invested, and he's lifted our spirits by his persistence in reminding us in so many venues, from the book notes in Commonweal to his writings on the saints and theology, and most recently <coughs> on, the chapel, on the chapels of the University of Notre Dame. That mystery is an inescapable and beautiful part of our lives. In gratitude and in appreciation, please join me in welcoming Larry Cunningham. Everybody. I think John has my lecture. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> I'm going to presume that everybody went to Mass last Sunday but I'm not going to quiz you to find out if you remember the three readings we had, but I want to make reference to the second reading, which was from the Epistle to the Hebrews. And this great line from chapter 2, verse 9, but we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made 
lower than the angels, but now crowned with glory and honor. So Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels. This reflects an idea in the Bible that between human beings and God, there is a realm of spiritual beings who we call angels. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says, quite economically, quite briefly, the existence of the spiritual non-corporeal beings that sacred scripture usually calls angels is a truth of faith. The witness of scripture is as clear as the unanimity of tradition. That's from 328 in the Catechism. Angels in the Catholic tradition are invoked in the liturgy and are part of popular piety. I'm going to do three things today. I'm going to do a kind of a survey about angels. And then I'm going to show you some pictures, even though we can't depict angels, but the tradition has had to do that. And then I'm going to tell you a story, and I will conclude in good time. So I begin with a very sharp observation from St. Augustine, who says that the word angel is not a name, but the description of an office. Because the Greek word angelos, from which we get the word angel, means a messenger. An angel's name is spirit, but that spirit's office is to be a messenger, says the great saint. If we look at the biblical narrative, we find these figures, typically we call angels, running like a red thread from Genesis to the book of Revelations. A closer inspection allows us to specify in more precise detail how they function in the Bible. First, they often appear in the biblical narrative in the strict sense of a messenger, a messenger from God, acting, as it were, as an intermediary. In fact, in some Old Testament narratives, the angel is a kind of a mask for God actually speaking, a device evidently used to protect, for the Jewish mind, the transcendence of God. So sometimes the narrative will say the angel of the Lord. Two verses later, they will say the Lord. Second, they are not infrequently understood as a heavenly court praising God. In the infancy narrative in the Gospels, we see both functions clearly. If you look at Matthew and Luke. An angel appears to Mary at the Annunciation and to Joseph in a dream. And at the birth of Christ, the shepherds experience the presence of an angel court singing Gloria in excelsis, heralding the birth of the new Messiah, the Savior. Finally, a passing reference of Jesus gives us the concept and the, tr and the tradition of an angel who protects each and every person. We call them typically guardian angels. Matthew 18.10 says, See that you do not despise one of these little ones. This is Jesus speaking. For I say to you that their angels in heaven always look upon the face of my heavenly Father. Unquote. Well, who or what are angels? Now, the notoriously unmetaphysical, non philosophical biblical writers thought of them as kind of subtle beings who often took human form. Even some of the early fathers of the church thought they were composed of some subtle form of fire. But under the pressure of Greek philosophy, the angels began to be described in the Christian tradition as pure spirits. 
created by God for the purposes outlined above, to serve as messengers or to serve as a heavenly court, um, uh, adoring God. I know a great story. Uh, someone asked uh, the great Protestant theologian Karl Barth, who was the greatest musician? Was it Bach or was it Mozart? And Barth wrote famously on Bach, and he loved Mozart. And Barth said, in heaven, before the throne of God, the angels play Bach. <laughs> when they're off duty, they play Mozart. <laughs> that captures those two musicians quite well, by the way. But to think of angels as pure spirits creates fascinating speculative, speculative things to think about. The Summa of St. Thomas, for example, has 356 comments on angels in the Summa alone. But in addition, the problem about angels is that if you wish to depict a pure spirit, how do you do that visually? How do you do that in art? The iconographical tradition in Christianity answers variously that they appear as young adults of indeterminate gender or as militant soldiers in the case of figures like St. Michael, the archangel, or as little infants with tiny little wings, which is borrowed directly from paganism, uh, known as the putti or the amoretti. And with all of these figures depicted typically as winged, to illustrate, to illustrate the speed with which they move. So angels typically have, uh, have wings. Now, one of the most important moments in the history of angels in the Christian West occurred around the year 500, when a, an extremely enigmatic figure who called himself Dionysius and pretended that he was the man converted by St. Paul in Athens. He, in fact, was a Greek-speaking Syrian monk. Uh, left us a number of books. Uh, one set of books were called the, Names of, uh, the Name of God, The Names of God and Mystical Theology. And in The Names of God, he described all the ways in which God is described in the Bible, all the names of God in the Bible. And then he wrote another book called Mystical Theology, by which he simply meant hidden discourse about God. And in that book, he talked about how you could not really say anything adequate about God. And Dionysius meant that you should read those books together. Things we can say about God, things we can't say about God. But then, afterwards, he wrote a book called The Earthly Hierarchy, or The Church Hierarchy. He, in fact, invented the word hierarchy, which means a sacred order. And he describes nine functions of the church. And then he wrote another book, and this is pertinent for our discussion, called The Celestial Hierarchy. And he rooted through sacred scripture, and he got every description that he could think of of angels. So he thought there was an earthly hierarchy worshiping God. You can think of this liturgically. And then a sacred or celestial hierarchy in which similar worship dialectically was occurring uh, with the earthly hierarchy. And he named these nine creatures as angels, archangels, cherubim, seraphim, virtues, powers, thrones, dominations, principalities. There was a time when in catechism you had to memorize that uh, nine order of uh, angelic figures. Now where these show up a lot is in the liturgy, especially in the Eastern liturgy, where the notion is that the heavenly 
church mirrors the worship of the early church, uh, of the earthly church. So that when we pray together in the liturgy, and this is sometimes reflected in the various Eucharistic canons, we are in praying with the heavenly choirs of angels, the nine orders of angels. Um, I, I found, while well, this was a really interesting talk to give, I found while uh, uh, doing the research for this talk, this great prayer from the Coptic Church, Coptic Orthodox Church. I have a Coptic icon to show you in a few minutes. Seven archangels stand glorifying the Almighty and serving the hidden mystery, Michael the first, Gabriel the second, Raphael the third, symbol of the Trinity, Surael, Sakakel, Sarateel, and Ananael. These are the shining ones, the great and pure, who pray to God for mankind the cherubim, the seraphim, the thrones, the, dom the dominions, the powers, and the four living creatures bearing the chariot of God. The 24 elders in the church of the firstborn praise him without ceasing, crying out and saying, holy is God, heal the sick. Holy is the almighty, give rest to the departed. Holy is the immortal, bless thine inheritance. May thy mercy and thy peace be a stronghold unto, the, unto thy people. Holy, 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 Lord of hosts, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Intercede for us, O angels, our guardians, and all heavenly hosts, that our sins may be forgiven. Uh, I think that, as the Catechism rightly points out, one of the places where we hear the function of angels best is to correlate the understanding of angels with the liturgy. That is, when we as a community pray together, we are praying in union with, and this is Dionysius' idea, the earthly church and the heavenly church as the two pray together. Now, I have uh, uh, an important point to make, however, and it's this. And I'll come back to this when I end with my anecdote later on. Our understanding of angels must place them within the context of the mystery of Christ. Christianity does not worship angels. In Colossians, St. Paul warns against self-abasement and the worship of angels in chapter 2. While the opening chapter of the letter to the Hebrews contains a polemic against those who see, who see angels as equals to Christ, by citing seven passages from the Old Testament arguing for the superiority of Christ over the angels. So evidently, in the first century of Christianity, there were people who were angel worshipers, and the, epistle to the, the letter to the Hebrews and the epistle to the Colossians makes the point we don't worship angels. Christ was not an angel. He was incarnate. I always like the thought of Jacques Maritain, the great Catholic philosopher, who insisted decades ago that there are two persistent errors in culture. One is the error of what he, uh, Maritain called bestialism. That is to reduce all human beings down to the category of beasts. And the other, of course, he calls angelism. A reluctance or a resistance to think of us as bodily creatures. The denial of the incarnation is a form of angelism. The key text in scripture is verse 14 of the prologue of John's gospel. And the word was made flesh. So we can't reduce our lives down to that of the brute beasts, and at the same time, we cannot deny our bodiliness and rootedness in the bodily. Uh, the writer who, more than any other writer uh, that I know of, who picked up this notion and, and pursued it generally was the wonderful fiction writer Walker Percy. So he frequently will refer to that distinction between 
um, treating human beings as if they were angels, lacking bodies, uh, or reducing human beings down to the bestial. So let me uh, show you a few pictures of angels. And uh, maybe I'll then make a, a comment or two. Uh, this, is a, this is a great picture. Um, this is called the Portinari Altarpiece. It was done by a artist in the Low Countries up in the north. The Portinari family very definitely belonged to what today we call the 1%. They were extraordinarily wealthy people who belonged to a Florentine banking family, and they lived up in what would be present-day Belgium, Holland, and so on, as representatives of the bank. And they had a northern European um, painter named Hugo van der Goes paint this great scene of the nativity for the benefit of a hospital that they endowed in Florence. So the painting was done in the north, shipped down to Florence. It's in the Uffizi Gallery uh, to this day. And it depicts the nativity of Christ, who's here. But I'd like to point out to you um, uh, the, the angels. First of all, there's an angel who is doing, uh, who uh, uh, is uh, a messenger, uh, echoing the, the um, uh, scene of the Annunciation. Here in the background are the angels who sang Gloria and Excelsis, and here you have these three wonderful peasants who are coming to adore uh, the newborn Christ child. There are two angels here who are in adoration, and then I'd call your attention particularly to these angels, especially these over here, who are um, uh, clothed in rich liturgical garments. You see them there on the, on the lower right-hand side. And every one of these colors, by the way, have significance. You can, and I'm not going to do it, but you can actually count out the nine choirs of angels, according to Dionysius in this uh, painting. And there's the large figure of Our Lady. Here's St. Joseph, typically depicted in this period as an elder man off to the side. And then look at this one little thing, particular thing down here. There's a shoe with no one in it. Huh? This shows up in a lot of Northern Renaissance painting to indicate that this is a sacred scene. If you remember in Exodus 3, take off thy shoes for thou art in a holy place when God speaks through the um, uh, burning bush. And so to, to indicate that there is a sacred scene going on, oftentimes these painters, especially painters in the north who were crazy about symbolism, would uh, put these little uh, figures like this shoe at the corner. There's a famous marriage portrait of the Portinari family um, in which the married couple is standing in the center and over on the left-hand side as you look at the painting, there's a pair of shoes, no one wearing shoes to indicate that this marriage was a sacred event. And then right smack in the center, there's a little dog to symbolize fidelity, Fido for uh, fidelity. So. This is a painting that uh, will give you an idea of the richness of the, of the angelic tradition. There's even a, a better a painting by a lesser known person in the uh, uh, Art Institute in Chicago, which I was going to get, but I've visited the Portinari altarpiece many times, so I thought I would do this. This is probably, in my humble opinion, the greatest religious painting ever done. It's in Moscow. The only reason I'd like to go to Russia, I mean, Russia's a beautiful country and all that, but the only reason I'd like to go to Russia is to see this original. This is by Rublev, done in the middle of the 15th century. It's called the Old Testament Trinity. And it's based on the story in the 18th chapter of the book of Genesis, 
in which Abraham and Sarai have a, three visitors that come to see them. And Abraham shows hospitality. He says, sit down, we'll prepare some food for you. And one of the visitors says at the end, uh, your wife, Sarah, uh, will have a child. Do you remember what happens? Sarah laughs because she's elderly. Then instead of three persons, one person who's described as the Lord says, why are you laughing? Now here's the interesting thing. You have three visitors. These are obviously angelic visitors. Huh? But they are angels in disguise. So you have three people in the beginning, the three angelic visitors, and you have the single voice of the Lord speaking later in the 18th chapter. And what do you think the early fathers of the church and the Russian and the Byzantine tradition typically thought of this? This was some kind of a foreshadowing of the doctrine of the Holy Trinity, three and one. So you have the three visitors uh, depicted here in the scene. And then you have the voice of one person speaking uh, later. So you have three persons, one voice, so, and, and you, so you have the divinity. And so this is called the Old Testament Trinity. It is absolutely in my mind. Unfortunately, I think it's shown too much today. So you see it too often, and you don't realize how beautiful it really is because it's depicted. Even when I got my class notes together about a year or so ago, the coffee shop, put the Old Testament Trinity on the cover for a Christian tradition. So you see it a lot, but it's a really powerful um, um, uh, invoking. And, and actually, there's a significance to all of the, um, uh, to all of the faces. This is an Annunciation scene. This was um, written by, painted by, or written by, as they say, a contemporary nun, a Benedictine nun, who is in a monastery outside of um, Jerusalem. She's a Canadian woman. She's also a midwife. Um, and um, this is a, my personal collection. Uh, so you have Our Lady, and you have the winged figure um, coming to uh, do the Annunciation. Now, I think what's interesting about this is that, and this often appears in Eastern art, our Lady is holding a spindle with yarn. It's not very clear here. Uh, uh, that relates to a story which is not found in the Gospels, but which is found in the so-called non-canonical or apocryphal Gospels, that Mary, as a young woman, worked in the temple in Jerusalem as a number of young women did, weaving the cloth for the great curtain of the temple. It's kind of a neat story because the canonical writers will tell us later that the curtain was rent at the death of uh, Jesus. So it was a kind of, you could see how the artists are trying to get a kind of a correlation. But here you have the angel richly uh, robed with uh, uh, the winged figure and so on. Here's another, uh, this is a Coptic uh, icon. Um, and here you see Mary has the uh, spindle uh, weaving the wool here. And the angel now is done in much more Egyptian or Ethiopian style. Language is up there is in, um, is in Coptic. This uh, icon was painted by a Coptic Christian cab driver in Jerusalem. Um, and um, it was given to me some years ago uh, via uh, Father Jim Birchall, and I've had it in my collection ever since. But in, um, in this angel is barefooted, but with the, but with the wings. Does anyone recognize where that's from? I'm sorry? Sacred Heart Basilica, as you walk into the sacristy on the right-hand side, there is a, um, 
uh, there's a stained glass in one of the small windows. Above it is the figure of Our Lady the Church. And there's the guardian angel protecting the child who is either lost or fallen asleep in the woods or whatever the, whatever the case may be. This is another guardian angel. This is actually uh, ceramic um, on glass, 19th century ceramic on glass. This comes from my grandfather's house. He evidently had this in his home. It's a pride of place. My wife said one time, I married you so I could have possession of this uh, <laughs> piece of art of our angel protecting a mother and a child on the, on the stormy seas. And that's much more the way we kind of think of the figure of an angel now, kind of indeterminate gender in diaphanous white with these uh, great wings and so on. So I'll leave that up for a second. And I will now tell a story. And then I'll conclude and take any questions or comments uh, from the audience. Some of you may remember um, about 10 or 15 years ago, there was a huge interest in popular culture in angels. A woman um, turned out to be, an, uh, she was a Mormon woman. The angels were very important in the LDS church, but she wrote a book, I forget the exact title, it was something about getting in touch with your angel or something. It was on the nonfiction bestseller list for the better part of a year. I then, be, then began to notice that people were traveling around the country renting uh, the conference space of holiday inns, offering seminars on how to get in touch with your angel. Never, ever underestimate the American capacity to make a buck. <laughs> I mean, these places, they were all over the country. And then simultaneously, I would get telephone calls uh, from reporters, uh, print reporters and people from television who saw this phenomenon that was happening. And they would ask, you know, well, why do you suppose this interest in angels and uh, what are angels, and so on and so forth. So I would kind of do the, um, uh, you know, the standards stuff about uh, what the Catholic Church believes about angels and, and so on and so forth, and pointing out that because we believe that there are uh, spiritual beings between humanity and God, that they get variously depicted in art that uh, angels don't have bodies, and so somehow we have to give not only a shape to the body, and this is an attempt to give a shape to the body that to indicate that it's really not a human person with this diaphanous uh, robe on and a kind of ethereal looking uh, body. And then the wings have been traditional to indicate how they move from one place to another. Actually, metaphysically speaking, it's very interesting to speculate how does an angel move if it's pure spirit? Read your St. Thomas on that. I'm not going get in, to uh, get into it. So they would ask various questions about this type. And then a couple, um, and I would always end this by saying, now look, we need to put this into some kind of context. Christianity is not about angels. So this emphasis on getting in touch with your angel and whatnot, while interesting, is not central to the, to the center of the Christian faith. The center of the Christian faith has to do with the Son of God who becomes incarnate. And angels are, in a sense, like spirit carriers in the opera. They kind of add to the story, but they're not central to the figure. So they would take this down, and I would refer them to the opening chapter of the epistle to the Hebrews, etc. Every once in a while, um, one of these reporters would say to me, well, do you believe in angels? You 
know, it's kind of a snotty question to ask uh, a, a person what his or her particular beliefs were. I, I'm supplying the information, but they want to have this kind of personal testimony. So what are you going to say to the rude reporter who asks the question, do you believe in angels? And my answer was always the same. And I think everybody here in the audience will be able to help me with this. I said, from the time I was a child, maybe before I went into school, I was taught to pray for the aid of my guardian angel. Let's see how many people know what prayer I'm talking about. Angel of God, guardian dear, to whom God's love entrusts me here, ever this day be at my side, to earn, to rule, to rule and guide. Amen. So you guys know it. So uh, <laughs> I just wanted to test to see. So the catechism has taken, parental instruction has taken. So I've said I learned that prayer when I was five or six years old. I've said it intermittently, taught it to my own children. So if I die and there are no angels, I'm going to be really disappointed. <laughs> so you use the piety of the church to reinforce the faith. You don't misunderstand the angels according to the pictures that you have of them, but as those great beings who are our mirror image in heaven, um, praying before the Father, maybe playing Bach, uh, that uh, mirrors us who on this journey of life likewise join together in the liturgy. Thank you all very much. So, um, as I've said before at these gatherings, um, I'm going to pause and I will take questions from the audience. I'll pause 30 seconds and I'm an old teacher. And if no one has a hand up, I'll begin to call on people. <laughs> no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that to you. So would anyone like to ask a question or add a comment? Yes, sir. And then Sister Ann and then back there. Uh, Mr. Cunningham, uh, the other side of the coin of the angels, uh, the one who comes to me is the concept of fallen angels. The fallen angels. So can you just speak generally to the idea? Is there a scriptural word? There is a scriptural, there is a, a scriptural echo in the epistle to Jude about the, about the fallen angels. And um, there's, a, there's a lot um, in the tradition, both Jewish and Christian, about the fallen angels. Um, the chief of whom is the light bearer, which is what the word Lucifer means, the one who bears light. There's been much speculation about why the angels fell. It raises a lot of interesting questions like, did angels have free will? And so on. One beautiful story, this is not a dogmatic truth, but a, a, a story is that the angels saw the incarnation, foresaw the incarnation, and would refuse to worship a being lower in stature than themselves, someone who had a body. So they talk about Lucifer's pride. Uh, now, let me add one other word. Uh, it's a good subject. Um, one of the, uh, I take very seriously the idea that there is um, a satanic force in the world. Again, I would appeal to not only to the Bible, but to the whole of the church's tradition. The problem with understand, I actually wrote an essay on this some years ago. The problem with understanding the notion of a satanic force is that we are oftentimes beguiled or confused by popular representations in art. So if you talk about a devil, you think of someone with uh, horns and a pointed tail and red and so on and so forth. And it's easy to kind of mock those kinds of pictures. But um, if you can, the same, same problem, by the way, with angels. So if you can abstract from the, what occurs in our imagination, you can ask yourself the question, are there 
evil forces in this, uh, in this world. Can people be somehow more powered by evil than by good? I one time by accident met a homicide detective who had interrogated uh, Ted Bundy, the famous serial killer, Dunham, who was captured in Florida. And uh, he was a good old country boy. And he said to me, he said, when I interrogated Ted Bundy, he said, I've, I've handled hundreds of murderers. He said, I looked into his eyes, and his eyes were as cold as the eyes of a shark, even though he was a personable kind of person. He said, I've never used this word before. He said, but Ted Bundy was an evil person. Here's the point I want to make. You have to be able to name evil as evil. And in order to do that, you've got to get past the stereotypes or the caricatures of what an evil force might be. I think that's true of the tempter, Satan the tempter, or Lucifer the light bearer. And the, and the problem, and, and the way to do that is to somehow get beyond the pictures, the cartoon pictures that we have in our head. Um, however, I would add to this point that I don't think that the power of evil can be equated with the power of good uh, because it's critical to the Christian faith that in the end, good overcomes evil. Love overcomes hatred. The grace of God is more powerful than our capacity for sin. But I didn't, I didn't bring up the devils uh, or the fallen angels, but I've thought about them a lot. Thanks for the question. Sister Anne? Right. And, um, and so I was wondering, what do you think? Is that, how does that function in popular culture? Is it more to kind of tempt us in that, toward that angelism? Or is it something that can actually draw people um, to Christ? Yeah. And there was the movie with the guy that had, who was an angel, and he had to hide the wings. I can't remember. I don't, I'm not a big movie goer. I'm sorry? No, not Warren Beatty, but John Travolta, I think. Uh, yeah, Michael, was that the name of it? Yeah. I, well, I think, that, I think there are two things to be said. One, if someone is interested in angelic beings, that's always a, that's always a starting point for something that you can talk about more deeply, which is to say, where do angels come from? What are their functions? From whom are they sent? Ought we not to pay more attention to the one who sends or the one who is adored rather than a figure? In terms of popular culture, I think that one of the reasons why the belief in angels is so widespread is the fact that we don't like the idea of being totally alone. You know, if you have to do something that's really dangerous, uh, cross a mountain pass or get through a jungle or whatever the case may be, it's comforting. I'm not saying that you, this is a proof. I'm only saying it's comforting to say someone is watching over me. And it's e easy to extrapolate that to, uh, to an angelic figure, someone who was actually near you. And that, again, I think is a launching place for evangelization. And Sister Anne does make the good point by the way, that the word angel and evangelize comes from the same Greek roots to announce. Or to, uh, i got to take this man and I'll take you. Yes. Yeah, this is serendipitous, but when you said you're going to bring up an incident, I was thinking of the same thing. I was out in California, and the expression out there, this kind of falls into the area of area, or, or, or oh, I, I won't get it, but it falls into kind of the mystical area. Um, plaster angels 
Don't put on highways. I mean, you saw things around the city in Los Angeles, but this was a phenomenon. Or whether this was organized from a group or whatever, I thought the same thing that you're saying. You know, things can be pretty shallow in any city, but I mean, Los Angeles has a place. But these, at least in the area that you would see on a highway, all of a sudden the cheap plaster just had of that. And then in the stores, the same things were happening. It was the head of the angel and those cute little things. And then they started appearing everywhere as you well, Los Angeles, of course, is Our Lady of the Angels. Yeah, so you've got the, uh, you've got the uh, Los Angeles, yeah. There's something that it seemed to me is not orchestrated, but somewhat arises, and then it's caught on, and then it, then it loses out of it. But you saw it in all the stories, cheap stories. I am a keen student of... Um, and I don't carry a phone, I don't carry a camera, but I've always wanted to stop and take pictures of wayside shrines of some teenager that wraps his car around an embankment or something and these little shrines appear. They're very interesting to look at. And quite frequently, you will find in those scenes figures of the angels. Uh, this idea that, that maybe even by transference that now this person who's died is now an angel looking out after us or something. Yes. Now, I'm sorry, yes. Church must uh, believe fairly firmly in the devil or evil because of an exorcism. Yeah, but we exercise babies. <laughs> we have exorcisms. Uh, you know, we have, this, uh, we have these rites in the baptismal, uh, we have these rituals in the baptismal rites about the exorcism of, uh, of everyone, separating the person for God and away from the devil and all of his pomps. That's a word we don't use a lot, but it simply meant pagan worship. Uh, but that's what the, the pomp uh, word it was a form of uh, pagan worship. Here again, however, I think that uh, there's uh, people that run around and give uh, seminars on how to exercise um, uh, devils. Uh, this is a big thing to these days in evangelical religion about uh, exorcisms and so on. Here again is the same problem that we have with respect to angels and devils, and that is we've been overly influenced, in this case, by movies. Um, so The Exorcist, um, and then all of the second-rate movies that have kind of come out of that. And they tend to be full of what the Germans call Sturm und Drang, all kinds of fabulous things that kind of happening. I remember seeing that movie when it first came out with a friend of mine who's a rabbi. We went together to see the movie. And as The Exorcist goes down the corridor to go in to see the young girl, but my guy sitting next to me was saying, don't open that damn door. <laughs> you know, he was fearful about, you know, what they were going to see, you know, with the green vomit and all the, uh, this kind of stuff. Yeah, well, um, if you take the word, how am I doing on time here, John? Am I okay? Yeah, that's 11.30. Okay. Um, if you take the word exorcism, more generally speaking, that is to inoculate against evil, you could say that the sacrament of penance, reconciliation, is a kind of a form of exorcism. All forms of prayer, that is, or lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, is a kind of an exorcism rite. So I think we, I, there, there is the history of exorcism, exorcism goes all the way back into the earliest strata of the church, but there's a way to understand exorcism also more broadly, I think. John Jack Blatty, who wrote that novel, based that novel on a pamphlet describing an exorcism that had happened in 1947. And I think the exorcist ended up at 
St. Louis University. I haven't kept all that stuff in my, in my head, but it does appeal to my promiscuous mind to <laughs> read about that kind of stuff. Yes, please. And then John. Sure, you do. Yeah. <laughs> and like when I'm driving, you know, don't drive faster than your guardian angel can fly, that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> I have a little like, sticker on the car. Um, but where did that like come from? Where did that like originate from? The notion of the guardian angel? Yeah. From that text that I just read to you, that where Jesus says that uh, be careful about not scandalizing the young ones because their angels in heaven watch over them. And it's so a kind of, it's interesting in the history of the tradition out of how an observation in the Gospels can efflorescence out into a whole series of devotions and depictions and so on. Keep driving safely. <laughs> yeah. John? I have a question. Um, it's a boring question. Um, you know, your mention of Dionysius prompted it in part. If you look at antiquity, so you look at people like Origen, or people like Augustine, people who are magnificent theologians, um, who spend a, have a lot invested, spend a lot of time in thinking about the angel's origin, and the guardian angel is a good example. Um, but have all kinds of cosmological speculations involving the angels. On the one hand, if you look at contemporary theology, there's absolutely no interest in the angels. In a way, that mirror, I mean, it's the inverse of the popular <clears throat> level, where there's so much interest. What, why do you think, what, what, what do you think explains the fact that the religions <coughs> seem to have basically, just have no interest in the topic? I mean, well, no, I think you're quite right, and I think that, here's the fact, the facile answer to the boring question, uh, you know, is this. Origen and Augustine, St. Anselm of Canterbury, Thomas Aquinas, Bonaventure, on up to the modern times, lived in a world which was alive with spirits. This was true in paganism before Christianity. So every, or pre-industrial Ireland, every well had a guardian spirit, every crossroads had a spirit. The banshees might show up at a funeral. The little people guarded the bridges and so on and so forth. That was ubiquitous in the ancient world. And here comes a great moment, folks. I'm now going to instruct John Cavadini on Augustine, <laughs> <laughs> who has forgotten more about Augustine than I've ever known. But John, you well know that all through, for example, the city of God, Augustine has to confront the, the, the way real people, Christian and non-Christian, believed in the world of daemons and gods and small g and goddesses and so on and so forth. And today people might not be interested uh, because we live in a flatter, more secular society, if that's in fact the case. But they had to, you know, Origen had to take this stuff seriously. I mean, he's in Alexandria. The Jews believed in, um, in angelic figures. Um, the, uh, the Gnostics believed, the Gnostics were full of angel uh, stuff. The pagan world in general uh, believed in that sort of thing. And we live in a culture today where it is not widely, where it is not widely believed. Uh, and I think that explains the difference, but angels are part of the vocabulary of the Christian faith. Um, Ron has written a little bit on it, and, and von Balthasar, but I would agree that many, you know, if you were going to go to the Catholic Theological Society of America and stand up and announce that you're going to talk about angels, ladies would pull their skirts over their knees like you were talking about something vaguely indecent. Uh, Anyone else wish to ask? A, yes, please. How did some angels um, start being referred to as saints? Well, I think that's a category mistake. Angels are, uh, they certainly are saints in the classical definition of people who are in God. But in, the, in terms of the taxonomy, we talk about the angels and the saints. Even though when we use the phrase holy angels, which is the title of a lot of church offices and so on, holy angels, 
you're, in a sense, etymologically speaking, saying saint angels. Right. We done? There is one last question. Okay. Uh, going back to your uh, comments about evil a few minutes ago, um, what are your thoughts about, do, do we have a tendency to transfer responsibility for the evil that we do, kind of the, the devil made me do it type of thing, as opposed to, you know, taking responsibility for ourselves? Oh, I think we need to take responsibility for ourselves. You know that the, the popular origin of that phrase, the devil made me do it, was done, was done tongue-in-cheek by a comedian, Flip yeah, Flip Wilson, who, who knew himself and the audience knew that he did it, but wants to kind of pass off the explanation to, uh, to someone else. Once you begin to say that we, we do not have to take re responsibility for our moral act, you bring out a can of worms. Don't people try to do that in courtrooms, for example? You know, uh, you have to take responsibility. I mean, our whole legal system, to, to take a non-religious example, is based on the idea you have to take responsibility for your acts. So Fred, not wanting to open that can of worms. <laughs> 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 Let's take a moment to thank our speaker. Thank you all very much.